podcasting from Chico, California. This is the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast, where we discuss fly fishing, guiding, fishery science and management, conservation, and more. No better. Fish better. Learn more at barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. This episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast is brought to you by California Trout working throughout the state to ensure we have resilient wild fish thriving in healthy waters for a better California. Support Caltrout's innovative science-based work by becoming a member or donating today at caltrout.org. Hey, welcome to a special episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chad Alderson. Uh, this is kind of an on the water, but we're not on the water. We're at the Coleman Fish Hatchery outside of, is it Cottonwood, Brett? It's Cottonwood, California. Yeah. If you're not familiar with uh, the Coleman Fish Hatchery, it sits on Battle Creek, which then goes into, did I say, yeah, Battle Creek, and then it flows into um, the Sacramento River. Tributary to the Sacramento River. Yeah. And it's got we should have brought our fly rods. And, yeah, we, have, <laughs> we talked about it, but um, the, we've been dealing with wind and stuff, and I just didn't feel like no, yeah, yeah. getting owned by the wind. Brett doesn't want us getting into his yeah. ponds either. <laughs> so we have Hannah in, uh, in the room as usual, and we're sitting in the office of Brett Gallion. Brett, you're the pro- is it the project coordinator? I'm the project leader of the Coleman project, National yeah. Fish Hatchery Complex. Thank, thank you. So you run the whole thing, basically. Yes, I oversee yeah. Coleman National Fish Hatchery where we're at today, and I also oversee Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery, which is located at the base of Shasta Dam. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so. How we're going to do this one, um, we want to talk strategy first. So basically just basically fisheries management strategy from a, a hatchery perspective and like kind of the things that you think about and your team thinks about when you guys are planning, say, the current the, the current run of fish that are coming in right now. There's there's salmon, I assume, coming up the ladder right now. Yeah, we're spawning today. Yeah, because in, it's in October and this is the time of year when, when they start to roll in. Um, so that aspect of it, but then also the 20, you know, planning for 2020 and beyond and like, you know, what some of your key performance indicators are, what, what's driving, you know, at a higher level, um, I guess, is it the department of fish and wildlife that's, that's driving some parts of the, of the management process for you guys or how does, well, they're the regulatory agency, the California yeah. department of fish and so, wildlife and also national marine fishery society. Okay. So, so NIMS does it as well then. Yeah, the three agencies work closely together on a lot of the fish issues. Cool. So we want to talk about the strategy piece of it, the management piece of it, and then we're going to transition and actually go out to the hatchery and basically get an audio tour of the hatchery, right? Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do a, probably the first ever audio hit uh, tour of a hatchery, but we're going to make it happen. Yeah, it'll be cool. be pretty quick. Yeah, if folks come out here, it should take a little bit longer yeah, time. Yeah, so there, there's kids running around downstairs <laughs> and everything. We're up in his office right now, so it's nice and quiet. But when we get out there, you guys are going to probably hear a lot of the environment, you know, um, the, the fish flopping around and, and people probably talking in the background. The facility is huge. It's, it, it's a lot bigger than... Than I expected. It's huge. Yeah, we're 75 acres, the hatchery is, and then we have another around 50 acres in our water easements and our intake. So, uh, well, we were talking about you. Let's start at the very beginning. You said you were a fly fisherman. I am. How'd you get into it? Um, in '88, parents took me up to Yellowstone and uh, went fishing out in the Yellowstone River and was a Hey, all the regulations say single barbless hook. Well, what does that mean, man? My rooster tail has three hooks. <laughs> Can't figure out how, how do I how do I figure this out? And so then on the way out, we uh, um, we saw some fly fishing lodges. And so I'm from San Diego originally. So uh, ended up going to a, an Orvis camp up in uh, Oregon. Learned how to fly fish, and then uh, was fortunate enough. My parents had a condo up in Mammoth Mountain, which was just about six hours away from San Diego, and so. Spent a lot of time on Hot Creek and Crawley Lake and Lower Owens and uh, ended up eventually fly fishing the surf in San Diego for Corbina and just kind of, you know, that's so how it started. Did you take the, the traditional route through school in terms of going like like fish biology and all that? Is that? Yeah, that's, I didn't know what I wanted to do in high school. My, you know, I kind of found out about this fish major. Yeah. And then I then I went to Humboldt State and did the fly fishing piece of it early on in your in your life. Do you think did that kind of contributed to you wanting to be a fish biologist? Absolutely. Yeah, that's it, super cool. It's a fish were like my passion. I mean, I yeah. I love the fish and I hope so. I mean, 
in San Diego, I did a lot of bass fishing. And then when I okay. took vacations to trout climates, you know, and trout rivers. And yeah, that's cool. So. Like, and then you were, you went to Humboldt State? So? Yeah, I went to Humboldt State. Cool. Spent a, a few extra years there fishing and then yeah. got it. started a family and then kind of had to start adulting and join the real world, you know. Nice. Couldn't and, it just take a... And you live in Reading now? I live in Cottonwood. Okay, so, Cottonwood. Yeah, just nice and close then. A few miles away from the hatchery. Do you still get to fly fish these days? I did two weeks ago. I went over to Bridgeport and... Oh, you just don't hit throw a bobber in the race? Uh, no, I, no, no. It looks look, looks a little bad when the project leader's out hooking, <laughs> hooking them out here. But uh, your steelhead breedstock <laughs> pond, man. I was I was uh, literally just you know saliva is running down both of my cheeks last time I was out here taking a little DIY tour. There's a whole that you know what I'm talking. Yeah, there's a there's a pond we're probably going to go by at some point today. Yeah, there's not that many, and it's still early, but. Yeah. Two years ago, we had 10,000 fish out there. Yeah, that was the largest. I was like, it was. Holy Christ, there's a bunch of steelies in there. That's when ospreys were getting involved. And, uh, oh, it, <laughs> it, it was crazy. I mean, we were having, I remember years where we didn't have 900 steelhead between October and January, and we had consecutive days of 900 fish three times. So, I mean, That's just crazy. to perspective, it was. And that was the first big run right after the 2017 water. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that, that, it was, uh, let's see, that's. 20 uh 2018 was 2018. the it was the big run so that's but the, those were those were gonna, they, those were drought fish though right which i i believe that's that? 2016 release which is a january event okay. and so if i remember that's when the sack got up to like thirty thousand, forty five thousand mm -hmm. during january mm -hmm. and we were able to hit those releases and it really did well this past year I don't remember the number right at the top i want to say it was like six thousand fish yeah. came back so it was another great steelhead year yeah Tremendous deal cool. here. Well, let's uh, let's talk like hatchery operations. Just you know, just the the strategy piece of it, like we were we were talking about earlier in the intro. Um, how do you guys how do you guys decide what you're gonna do for a given year? Well, why don't we start off with the falls that we have the fall chinook salmon that we yeah, have right okay, now? Cool, cool. Um, the hatchery develops a spawning plan, so we have our target. We need about thirty six hundred pairs spawned. So we'll come up with a spawning plan. We'll kind of uh, figure out how many we want to get each day, a reasonable target. We try to kind of pl plan it like a bell-shaped curve. You know, you can't say on the first day we're going to get 400. You know, you hope for 100 and you kind of have a plan and you, you go with your plan. And then it's reviewed by um, other internal folks. We have a hatchery monitoring evaluation staff at the Red Bluff Fish and Wildlife Office. You, you've talked to Jim Smith before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so some of his hatchery evaluation staff looks it over. And then also we have, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a California Nevada Fish Health Center here on spot. And so they also kind of look over our plan. And so then you have your plan and then you start to execute the plan. And then sometimes you have to have adaptive management because most times Information changes, the target yeah. changes. Sometimes the fish aren't there that week or... Adaptive management is basically <laughs> mitigation for shit happens, right? <laughs> That's word to say it. Kind of, yeah. kind of. I mean, you you know, you can have the best game plan, um, but maybe the fish aren't there or maybe the fish aren't ripe or maybe they're overripe or maybe water temperatures warm as we had in 14 and 15 with the drought. And so you, yeah. during our spawning, so we have our targets and we're constantly evaluating where we are on those targets. Once we hit our 12 million, we still keep spawning. So we're trying to do like a bell-shaped curve here. We're trying to get, we're not just trying to get the first 12 million eggs. We're trying to get 12 million eggs from beginning of October till the middle of November. What's the rationale? Why, why, why do it that way? Well, if you took, say, say you took all your eggs in the first three weeks, you could be condensing the run timing of those fish. And so that in the future, you might be reducing the number of late returning fish in October or November. If you, and then if there's a situation where you have warm water, now you have all the early fish returning early, it's warmer water, could potentially kind of be limiting your brood stock in the so future. So it's almost like a risk mitigation strategy, right? Is that is that a way to think about it in terms of like, if, if you if you pull the, if you stretch out the time, the time frame of when these fish are able to go up or down, or I guess down river, then there's, you, they're the as a whole they're more likely to have a bigger run that makes it out to the ocean is that, is that uh I'm, I'm just talking about run timing and spawn timing so even though some of the fish yeah. come back in october yeah. early october they might not be ripe ready to spawn 
So like last oh, week, for example, okay. last Thursday was our first day. We went through a couple hundred fish and found out that the females were running about 11% right. So in order to hit our target for that day, we would have to go through a thousand females to get a hundred. And okay. so basically the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. We got to stop, cancel, yeah, okay. and now we have to come so back. So you talk about um, a fish being ripe or not right? The eggs are still immature. Right. Yeah. Is that why you're? Yeah. This. Yeah. Female. The skein would be tight. It would be like what salmon fishermen would probably and look at for row. You guys can sample a female and, and know that the whole that whole uh, cohort of fish is going to probably be like this one. Is it? That... Well, you try to you try to kind of go through like a hundred or so and try to get a feel for what it is. You don't want to handle because right now water temperature cold. The fish are in relatively good shape. You'll see later they're pretty clean. But as each time they get handled, we're knocking the slime off, or they're stressing them out, we're crowding them up. You do that too many times, and they're not going to be here. Okay. And so if they're green, what we refer to them as kind of like bananas, they're green. They're not ready to spawn. You want to hold on. That's a precious resource. It's limited time. Yeah. So you kind of have this balance of how many times you handle it versus you're going right. to... It, it, well, it's kind of like you know fruit in the in an orchard. Like they try not to put the, the, as few as few human hands on the process as possible because it gets bruised as it goes from you know the field out to the the grocery store, right? And it's kind of a similar concept, I guess. A little bit. I mean, we definitely do get our hands on them because we have to. Yeah, we have yeah. to do the eggs. I always but... like to use analogies that probably don't are, are completely off off base. Why? Why is twelve million the number? Why that's kind of that's what our uh, our biological opinion states. So that's what we can uh, raise successful here. We can raise healthy fish, and uh, with the uh, raceways that we'll see later, mm -hmm. um, kind we, of the carrying capacity, the carrying those. capacity at release. So you kind of work backwards. Um, you know, I guess the good way is you know if you put you know how many babies can you fit in a phone booth. Versus the three of us trying to get in the phone booth, you know, mm -hmm. so you have to plan for the release size and that's how we stock our, our Thanks. raceways. So Thanks for putting a phone booth full of babies. In <laughs> no problem, man. No problem. <laughs> has, how much has that changed since you've been here uh, as far as that planning goes and is, is genetics a part of that now too, or, um, as far as the fall plan, it, the number hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. It's obviously changed over. Coleman's 77 years of being in existence has mm -hmm. changed. I've been here 11 years. The program has remained 12 million. Mm -hmm. And so um, when um, when you guys are, are selecting those mating pairs, like what's the how do you go about that? Because it's this gets down to like eugenics, right? Um, how do you guys go about making those those pair those pairings? Like what are you looking for? Again, for the fall program, personality, it's personality. just uh, no, it's an online dating program where they where they select what they're looking for. You know, uh, looking for <laughs> at a post fit and present yeah. at a phone for present night uh, not. You know, <laughs> no. Um, you'll see down later today. Uh, staff are handling the fish, and basically we're determining if the females are ripe. It's like life, guys. Women run the world. You know. Yeah. So the, if a female salmon's ripe, we'll then we'll then bonk her on the head. Okay. We'll slide it down the line, and then we'll take a male. And then we'll slide it down, and then they're just spawned together. So, okay. the there's not really a genetic plan to this. It's one to one mating because we're taking three thousand thirty five hundred pairs. We're not really concerned with the genetics. Right. It's not a small enough number. Yeah, like that makes sense. So, you, because you're starting with so many, we're not really considered about losing genetics. You just want to make sure it's one to one. Okay. Um, Usually early in the run, there's a lot more males than there are females, and typically by the end of the run, you're 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 looking hard to get all the males. So it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, I on on the the, the line of genetics, um, with respect to wild fish versus hatchery fish, um, it, is there a in your mind is there like a delineation, like a a strong delineation between? what is considered a wild fish and what's considered a hatchery fish in, I would say below, let's just use Shasta as an example, below Shasta Dam, because it's all managed basically. Um, you know, if the way that I've, I've heard it two different ways, there's like genetically pure wild fish. And then there's also the de defini definition of a wild fish is basically if, if the, if the fish is spawned out in the, in the river, 
and is and returns, it's a wild fish. But it could be two spawning pairs that were actually hatchery fish. But the brood stock is, or I'm sorry, the 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 offspring would be considered wild because it was not in a hatchery. You know what I mean? I, this is, I, I use terms like natural and hatchery, okay. not really wild. So I, because okay. I think what you're saying is. Potentially, if a hatchery fish returns, spawned out in the Sacramento River, yeah. its offspring will have an adipose fin because it's and, outside, and, therefore it's and then therefore, wild. therefore, it's considered yeah. wild where it has it. Um, they've been collecting and spawning fish in Battle Creek for over a hundred years, so um, you know, I I think uh, maybe there are a few wild fish out there, but I think it's more yeah. natural fish. There's fish. We try to manage the hatchery ladder in Coleman National Fish Hatchery to leave fish, salmon, out in Battle Creek. I don't keep the ladder open all the time and bring every salmon in. I'm only trying to bring in about 10,000. Now, unfortunately, some years, that's almost every single fish that's out there because the run's, you know, the run's been hammered because of the drought. Mm -hmm. But right now, this year, our, our, we have an estimated count so far of 11,000 in the creek. Right. This it's, early. It's it's early. Yeah. It's early, and that counts about ten days old. It takes a lot of time for people to review uh, film. So I try to leave. I only try to take ten thousand fish in. I try to leave the other fish out in Battle Creek to and spawn. They'll, so they'll spawn, right? Okay. Some so of them was, will. That was one of my misconceptions. I thought every fish that took a right turn into into this hatchery would would go through the hatchery system, but that's not the case. You're just taking a of up to 10,000 and no more than 10. I'm trying to leave 20,000 okay. out in the creek now. Cool. You know, over the last few years runs been low, but that's what we try to yeah. that's what we try to plan. So again, I get this estimated number from a, a weir that's downstream about halfway between here and the mouth of Battle Creek where it's it flows. It, got a, has a camera and some staff reads the video and we get some, you know, post three to seven day information. And that's then how I try to manage the ladder and try to take in fish. And so it's constantly taking in information and trying to adjust. And, On the fly. and visually to the public, it's it, it could have an adipose spin and it was still raised in the hatchery, right? Because not every fish is clipped. Is that, is Correct. that right? The fall program um, oh. it under, is under the constant fractional marking program. So 25% of our 12 million, so 3 million are adipose clipped and coated wire tagged. So uh, if you were to come back in April, we would have a raceway of 450,000 Chinook salmon fry that maybe would have been spawned today. Mm -hmm. A hundred and, was that 115,000 of those would be coated wire tagged. Okay. The other three quarters, you wouldn't know. Right. Now I've got to ask like some really naive questions because I just don't know much about this world yet. I'm trying to learn. Um, so with the, let's just say those 450,000 fry, how do they get reintroduced back into the, the system just, just from ha this hatcheries? Okay, this we're talking about facility. just just the fall program? Yeah, yeah. As okay, because yeah. we have four programs and there's yeah. different release strategies and there's, so I just want to make yeah. sure that... We want to go over all of them with, yeah, with you do. if that's there's, okay. There's and it can be really brief. And where this question's headed is... That's uh, not for the episode two? <laughs> but where the, the line of question's headed is really around, um, okay, flow regimes related to when you guys re decide to release but uh, that that's kind of like where I'm where I want to go with this because I want to understand that because we you know we get we have a lot of buddies that that fish and they you know they see fry that are on the up on the banks and they're dead because there's it's something's been dewatered and and everybody's up in arms because the agencies the perception is the agencies aren't communicating so I want to like give you guys give you an opportunity to like really maybe demystify some of this and maybe set some records straight on how stuff works. Well, thanks. You could give me heads up before I got my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, now, lot, um, a lot of that happened, though, in the feather, too, you know, where the flows were super high, then they yeah. got dropped oh, down no, really yeah, low. Yeah, so it's... That's it's, actually it's, where we haven't heard anything about the sack. I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm, just having, I'm just having fun with you guys. No, <laughs> let's, let's talk about the falls. Okay. So, um, fall Chinook program, 12 million. Got to get them tagged to mark first. So I got to get those raceways tagged to mark before I can release them into the state waters. The raceways being the the those the smolts that are in the raceways. Yeah, at that time. So they got to get marked. Okay. Now, I got to hit a size. We have a size of ninety fish per pound. It's roughly about three inches for your 
for your listeners is the mark. We yeah. use fish per pound in the hatchery quite a bit and nowhere else is it used. So it's kind of this secret term I can use that you guys will just kind of nod and go, yeah, we're, 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 we, we follow you. But <laughs> 90 fish equals one pound of weight. Okay. So that's our release goal. So I got to hit that number. They have to be marked and tagged. Now I get to get my crystal ball out and start looking at next week's weather. <laughs> hey, you know, KRCR is telling me it looks like it's going to rain. Let's start circling that date. I then have to coordinate it. I had to coordinate it in advance of fish health before release. I got to get the fish health check done. I also then have to have the Red Bluff office come out, make sure that when they do a sample of like, say, three, 400 fish, that they are represented tagged 25%. Then after that, I now got to see if the creek flow is going to come up because I want to provide some cover and help expedite the smolts leaving Battle Creek into the sack. Yeah. So I try to line all those things up, <laughs> communicate with the other agencies to make sure we're not overlapping on stuff, and then we try to release. And so we try to release on storm events. And you have to do this when there's a high pressure system turning into a low pressure system <laughs> within that time frame, right? Well, that's when with the yeah. falls, I think the misconception is sometimes there comes a point where you have to release a fish in April. Mm. I know there's this perception that why don't you hold on until May? Yeah, we, we and, see that on social media all the time. And I know that there's the striper runs out in the Sacramento and it peaks up in May, but the water temp, you have to think three weeks out. It takes that smolt three weeks from here to get all the way out. So if I release that fish in May, it could take until late May, early June to get out. Water temperature. Get out to the sack? Get, no, just get out to the Golden Gate. Oh, okay. It takes three weeks to get out the Delta, system. Yeah. Okay. So our return data shows that the earlier those fall Chinook smolts get out, the better. Higher chances. It only Higher takes chances. three weeks for them to get down there? average i mean it that's it, fast though that, it, it, it seems is. amazingly oh, fast because it, it, it's is. a long I mean, it's a long journey it, it is and so one of the things that we've started here the last couple of years after 2014 2015 the hatchery trucked our smolts and just so what that is instead of releasing them in the battle creek we come in at two in the morning we load up five distribution trucks, uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, mm -hmm. sent some drivers over to help us out. We couldn't have got it, done it without them. And we took 21 days, not consecutive, and we would load up our trucks, takes two hours, load up five trucks, drive down to Vallejo, release them in net pens. And we did that over this time because of the drought. <clears throat> so how... How do how do you guys get around the imprinting problem, or do you like how do they how do you avoid um, I guess you know bleed off into other other hatchery returns that because they don't have a good imprint on your 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 particular hatchery. Well, what we found is when when we release them into Battle Creek, they return, and so yeah, right. kind of jumping fast forward, we just in the last two years we started a new program. It's reintroduction of winter Chinook salmon into the North Fork of Battle into, Creek. Into Battle Creek. And mm -hmm. so I'm kind of jumping programs here, just so we're all aware. But yeah. last year, uh, 2018 was our first release, about 215,000. This March, 200 and, uh, I'm sorry, 185,000. We collected 77 winter Chinook adults from that release this year. Um, great number for two-year-olds. They were all jacks. That's what we expected. And can you define a jack for the folks? A uh, jack is a, is a two-year-old male that comes back. And so it's kind of like a Mother Nature's uh, backup plan right. to, to help uh, make sure genetics are passed on and the female's eggs are not wasted. So He's the one in the back of the club that will steal your <laughs> <laughs> And so um, all of those fish that were released of the winter Chinook had an additional pelvic mark, a left pelvic fin. And we collected 77 of them, as I've mentioned. All of them were here in Battle Creek. Not one was in Sacramento River. Not one was at Keswick Dam, where we were collecting winners for the Livingston Stone Hatchery. They all returned here. And so strong. that's just, a, I know it's only a, a two-year data set, but 
That's super There's a lot of people out there in the sack collecting fish and would have seen them. And so they're able to home, home in on Battle Creek water. That's amazing. And so we're really, um, we're really excited about 2020 because we're going to get a three-year-old adult back and that'll be a big celebration for us. And mm -hmm. so they'll awesome. be returning there. So that'll be really exciting. That'll be Maybe that's the next time you guys get to come out. And there's a bunch of restoration work that was done on all that just to get those fish up in up in there a lot better than they have been in the past, right? Correct. They're, it's an ongoing process. It's yeah. not finished yet. They're right. still removing uh, barriers and infrastructure up there and trying to make it more suitable. But well, going back to what you were saying and, and 100 years of Battle Creek being operated and, and releasing these fish, um, the striper and, you know, and that release date and the fishermen being upset with the striper being involved and all that. They, these fish have cohabitated for a hundred years, right? When we have water, <laughs> both fish survive in, in the numbers on both fish are fantastic, right? So I, I don't know. I think it's yeah. kind of... Well, hard. we try to release during the conditions. I know um, when I talk to the guys, they talk about how they're able to follow our fish down each day around each bend and, and fish for the stripers. And... Um, we're trying to release fish now in March. We're trying a small program, release about 10% in March to get them out even earlier. Because of those drought years that we truck, we're trying to find alternative options that mm -hmm. maybe we could take advantage of weather events in March. But again, I got to give them the size. I got to give them the tagging. So we're just trying that. And so we, I haven't really focused on that data yet, but the first year return, three years would have been last year. But it's kind of a like a six-year program. Get multiple years return and then look at that and see if that's an option. Um, just trying to have more options available for the next drought because you yeah. know we're only what an, one bad year away from a, right. a drought year. Um, um, back to um, you know this inter interagency planning for for doing release. Um, is it what would be what would make your life easier in terms of being able to be a little more a little more fleet footed and do what you want to do without having a, you know, to, to, it sounds like a lot of red tape to me, um, you know, it, and, and if you don't want to answer it, it's fine. But like, like think like sky's the limit, like in a, in a perfect, perfect work management scenario, how would you like it to work? It's just hard because, you know, Monday morning quarterbacks never lose, right. you know? Right. And That's so what every, every fisherman's in Monday <laughs> and so, you know, you're, you're, you have to balance the biology, yeah. the fish. Yeah. How are things going? How are water temperature? Um, it's very cyclical here. What you see today, you come back in April. Now, all the falls are outside. All the steelhead and late fall Chinook salmon, another program, two other programs, they're all starting to hatch and they need space. So you have to balance all this stuff. I, I even, you know, I, I left out, I, I even look at the moon cycle nowadays, you know, I mean, <clears throat> so what it's, are, what are, that's interesting. What's you know, the, try not to release on a full moon, you know, I'm so, it's so, just, it's so predators, have predators for full moon. So, I mean, we're even balancing that. So hmm. it's just, sometimes you have to make the best decision yeah. and you have to move on it's and, like life, right? and, you know, and it, it upsets. I mean, we, we have passionate stakeholders. I mean, there's yeah, yeah, right. there's people that have a heritage cultural connection to these fish. There's other yeah. folks whose livelihoods and putting food on their table. There's other people who just like to be able to come out and see salmon, not have to look at him on YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And then there's like us who like to recreate and, you know, enjoy fishing. So, you know, everyone has their passion about it and they care and it's it's challenging, but sometimes I'm trying to manage what's you know best for the hatchery and the resource, and I have to make a decision and move on. And yeah, well, great way to put it. Yeah, good way to put it. So it's amazing how, how many different salmon runs you have to deal with, right? I mean, and you're talking about the logistics with these fish within the the raceways and getting them out and bringing them in. I, I, you, you don't think about little things like that, but it, I'm sure I'm looking at your desk and all these, you got <laughs> 20 folders sitting here, you know. With, well, I, my memory as I get older tends to go. So I, <laughs> I, I'm having a hard time going straight to just paperless and E, <laughs> right. you know, and then um, we're out here and sometimes, uh, our internet's not the best. So I've learned <laughs> having a hard copy sometimes can save you frustration. So I, I am a little over-organized with my, well, yeah, my folders. I mean, to, to Nick's point, I mean, if you look at it as a case management problem and, and there's those four 
distinct programs are going to require completely different, you know, but same kind of overall process, but definitely the, the, the devil's in the details for each one of those. Is there each one of those programs? Four or five? There's four programs. Four, okay. So maybe we'll just back up uh, the yeah. fall Chinook salmon program. That's our largest. Uh, our release goal is 12 million. The second is late fall Chinook salmon. That's a one million program that people think is like the winter run, and that right. I mean, there's a we're, we're still getting to, in there. In we're that. still getting that. Right. Then the other program for the long time was the steelhead, and I, I know you gentlemen have fun with the word anadromous. You know, so that's an anadromous <laughs> rainbow trout. Say it now. Okay, okay, that Most was you. Okay. Yeah. It's I funny. Say. I thought about you guys. I listened to one of your episodes, and then yesterday, um, I had an interpreter here for a, a, a tour and the one word that she brought up is can you help me with this word is anadromous <laughs> and i thought of you because of that one tape i listened to yeah. and so so those so getting back yeah. those were the three programs the falls the late falls and the steelhead and then here we just started this winter chinook salmon and so i'm sure you guys are aware sacramento river is the only river in the world that has four runs of chinook salmon yeah. and so here at Coleman, we have late fall, fall, and winter. And then and then there's the spring run. The spring run. And right. so those are more down towards the Chico area. Right, 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 right. Cool. Um, what, any other questions around this part of it? No, I don't think so. It's something that we missed, Brett. That, that we should have asked. That we, we didn't. Have, let's talk ozone <laughs> since we're not going to be able to see that part of it. Okay. Um, I didn't even know you guys had ozone. Is it, um, you, you make the ozone here, or is it shipped in and then you can pump it in? How does it work? Uh, we have a... Let's back up. Okay. Why is it important? Okay. Um, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, uh, a fish disease called, it's a IHN, it's like infectious hematic necrosis. I don't know, you'll have to Google it. And uh, it was pretty deadly. T could kill up to 25% of the salmon here. And so we got funding to create this ozone plant and so um, our water intake is on battle creek we bring the water in uh, we filtrate it we try to move any of the uh, additional sediment or any debris in there and then we use ozone to disinfect the water before it goes on to the fish and so uh, as long as the water is clear we're very effective at disinfecting it um, during turbid events there comes a point where you just can't remove yeah. all the sediment yeah. and so we try to provide clean, virus, disease-free water for a fish, allowing them the best chance. Because when you have 450,000 fish in a raceway, if one gets sick, yeah. it's really easy to spread it to all the other salmon in the raceway. So, Were there any... I always go back to this imprint thing because I'm so fascinated by the, the, a fish's ability to smell their natal stream. Um, if, if you're raising fish in say disinfected water, I would think that that those, those odor cues are not present at that time. But once they get in, if they're released in Battle Creek at some point, they're going to know what the Creek smells like. Apparently is that, did well, there's do any studies on like, I don't, do? I wasn't here in the early nineties when, know, when they, any studies like, Hey, here's a sample set. We're going to put this one raceway as our control group. And then we're going to disinfect the water and see if there's any difference in returns based on. And the idea is that the imprint, you know, would fall off if, if the water is, say, ozone. Interesting, interesting theory. I see where you're, you're going with it. Um, unfortunately, here, you're trying to ozonate the water to keep it, keep it healthy and clean. And when you had the IHN disease and you, had, you were losing 25%. So um, when, when we're out there, all the raceways that you'll see today... All have ozonation so the water. Other, the other question I have is actually if, if that was a path, pathogen or whatever, but is that still present in, in, in the creek, in the water? Uh, knock on wood, it's still present, but we haven't had any outbreaks since no, the sure. ozone. But, it, it's, but you, it's, run, you run everything through that ozone. Well, as long as we can. I mean, there are power issues okay. and things break. So where is that Where is that thing coming from upstream? Do they know? Did anyone try and figure out like what? How it's it it's just it's just naturally occurring. But yeah. when you have hatchery systems and you have large number of fish yeah. in a raceway, it's easy right. to spread. I mean, it's the same. It's the same rationale for keeping a lab sterile, right? Yeah. It's the same rationale. So I, I get it. I yeah. Yeah. So that's that helps us. Major reason why we produce quality salmon here is because of that ozone building. So it's 
um, on the tour today, you'll hear the generator in the background. And uh, so we're without power because of the windstorm. And so that's yeah. that humming noise in the background on the tours is what's keeping us going today. The Keep rolling them... blackouts we're having are a lot of fun. Yeah. We were supposed to ship a bunch of hats yesterday and we could <laughs> our whole specific thing was down. But anyway. Are you, are you familiar with the Nigiri project? No. The um, raising of salmon in the um, rice fields down oh, in the Yolo yeah, Bypass. The flood, in the flood plains there. So that yes, might sir. be a good way to, just because we're talking about contamination. I'm and, glad you brought that up. Man. And pivoting because I, I know it's been done and, and tried in the past of raising these fish in places like that. But contamination or disease was a problem. And that's where hatcheries kind of started perfection, you know, just making it a little bit easier for that process to go forward without having any contamination. But um, I was just curious if you knew about it, if you th feel like there's a place for it, like right next to a hatchery like this, or the way that the way that it's been described to us is like a chain of pearls, and and there would be these floodplain areas that were that were like earmarked during during uh, certain times of the year to incorporate nat naturally occurring floodplain water into say an agricultural environment that. The ag, the the ag uh, acreage isn't being utilized at that point in time. It's like a classic example is a rice field because they don't. It's just fallow during the winter, basically. Um, um, that so basically little little sites like that, you know, from the the upper reaches of the sack all the way down to the delta, essentially. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is just starting a project this year. I'll be collecting some eggs this October to start a to send it up program. no to send one up here we're still working out the logistics but we're working awesome. with cow trout and there's a we're going to flood a field up here i wasn't familiar with the title of it but i did go on a a field trip this past march and saw some stuff down by woodland i wasn't familiar yeah. with the title okay. of it but there are still some more hoops to jump through here in shasta county tama county up here but there is a small uh initial project that we're going to try to provide yeah. some fry yeah. for we certainly don't want to put you guys out of business but i'm really i'm what i've seen so far it it looks really interesting in terms of um that survivability in the earliest stages of that that life cycle where the, the fish are just they're be able to pack on you know size and they're you know in some cases three times bigger than the hatchery raised one so it's like it's just a good augmentation strategy i think and just hopefully gets the numbers even I don't ever see their place uh, in this world without there being a hatchery, unfortunately. But uh, I think the two of those plans together can just yeah. create a really healthy, yeah. awesome fishery worldwide. Well, I'm a little biased. I'm a, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, ha I'm a hatchery I manager, uh, but I'm, but I I see it. I guess I could kind of see it as a tool, another option. Um, you know, I, I worked up in Washington, and there were acclimation sites. You know, so hatcheries would take their would take their salmon or their steelhead smolts and put them in acclimation sites, more of a, a man-made structure, mm -hmm. but I kind of look at it that. And so, you yeah. know, we have this initial study that we're trying to come up with. It's really in the preliminary stages at this moment, but I'm interested in seeing it. You know, I, I'm interested in seeing how predation works or how you're able to mark those fish to then evaluate the success of it. Right. Um, so... Again, we're we're starting something. It's just an initial well, it's cool kickoff you guys phases. Are, like on at least going to start to do a pilot program and see you know check out the viability of it. it you know this there there hasn't been a lot of of uh, sites that they've done it on yet, but the ones that they have done it on in, in the, at the yellow project that we saw, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think it there's a lot of sense. there's much of it up here in the upper yeah. the upper watershed and. We're also doing another release study currently with uh, NorCal Guides and also mm -hmm. now it's Golden State Salmon Association. Just changed their name last oh, week. Did. Yeah, just changed their name last week. Oh, and so sure. we... Uh, we'll have to have James back on and talk about it. Well, that's thing. James NorCal, but this is Golden oh. State. So it's both of them, Golden State Salmon Association and also NorCal Guides. And so this, this past March, or was it April? Uh, time flies. We released... Uh, 200,000 fish here on site and then three days later based on what we thought estimated travel time and then we went down to Scotty's Landing and we we trucked 200,000 and released them there and so that's part of a three-year study that we're trying to get survival between here and Scotty's and then below Scotty's yeah. to see how yeah. our out migrating so you know we're doing several things that March release I mentioned earlier 
this Butte City with Golden State and NorCal guides, and then yeah. also here with this uh, cow trout and the floodplain. So we're trying to fi figure out a few different tools and techniques in our toolbox. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my personal feelings on hatcheries is they're they're kind of like a necessary evil for now until we can figure out how to like control floods and stuff like that <laughs> and, and and store water, and and also like the more salmon the better because there's a whole pot of orcas right off of our coast in particular <laughs> that doesn't have a whole lot of food. And their primary food source is salmon. Yes. So, I got a question. Um, <clears throat> so, it's kind of funny that we're planting, and maybe you don't, I don't even know where the fish come from. Where are the fish that get planted into Deer Creek? Uh, where do those come from? Do you know? Do you have any idea where those trout come from? That must be a state a state project. So, so you know the answer? it's just, it's crazy to me that they're, they're putting these planted fish into uh, an adramus stream. And, you know, for the public to come in and catch and keep and, and do their thing. Well, you're talking above, above, above the falls. So my thought is, why not, why aren't we doing hatchery steelhead into this anadromous stream? Why, you know, some of them will go out, some of them might stay. Has anybody ever talked about anything like that or have you ever? No, I, again, having the 75 acres here and another yeah. 50 um, you're, you're busy. I, I, I have a I have a biz busy. I have a big enough playground here that <laughs> I try to look inside the fence and uh, you know I'm well if there's some extra hatchery fish that are here and keep that in the back of your mind so maybe I'm, some maybe well, somebody I mean, we could throw some in some boxes <laughs> <laughs> I think it would do really well I think it would be awesome and I think um, yeah they're naturally sustained wild populations of fish like that. The anadromous ones that are coming through. See, I said it right. Oh, good. Um, that are coming <laughs> I must have watched an earlier. I must have listened to an earlier episode. They're present. They're not coming out of hatchery, but they're they're especially the ones on Deer Creek specifically. Are, it's a pretty small run, but still pretty cool. Well, let's you gonna take a tour of the the site. Yeah, sure. Take a bio break here. Okay. All right, we'll be edit, editing this one a lot. I'm so sure. can you, we're gonna, we're, so we're heading out of his office, going downstairs. Let me get microphone to Laura. Laura's gonna do the rest of this. <laughs> <laughs> all, our, all our great social media is because of her. Hi, Laura. Yeah. Hi. I follow your Facebook and everything. And only say nice things, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, I feel bad for you sometimes. Like, oh boy. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're gonna. So we're we just came out of his office. We're outside. Um, can you kind of give us a high level before we go to you know each each area just of what we're gonna see? Well, we're gonna start off by walking down towards 28 concrete raceways that are 15 feet wide by 100 feet long, and we'll talk about the late fall Chinook salmon in one set of those raceways, and then the other set are steelhead. Then we're going to take a short, maybe half mile walk down to the fish ladder. Uh, it connects the hatchery building to Battle Creek, and we'll see fall Chinook salmon migrating up the ladder, and also their spawning operations going in a large can building probably about a quarter mile from where we're standing right now. Perfect. Sweet. Let's do it. I'm kind of stuck. This is my first time here. I can't believe I've never been here to get an actual tour and see this facility. And come back the third Saturday in October, bring the family, it's the return of the salmon fest. Everybody That's the 19th, yeah? October, so right now it's like that big banner says right like there. The, the county fair meets the spawning day. Cool. So, That's awesome. pretty cool. Or, that. So there's a, there's the oh, demolition you derby. Been, you guys need a booth out here. That would be cool. The, the 19th? Yeah. Are we are we in uh, Denver or are we uh, back? We, we'll be back. We'll figure it out. All right. So... Uh, <laughs> We're standing in front of a raceway. I don't know how much white noise will come from the water, but... It's all good. Look at all that bait. <laughs> just one stri one 40 pound striper in there would just be like, done. We're talking about, we're talking about my babies here. Uh, at least wait for the next episode. Uh, these are our late fall Chinook salmon right here. Uh, they'll be released after Thanksgiving, hopefully before the New Year's on a storm event. And about 75 to 80,000 per raceway. They've been here on station. Uh, their parents came back January and February of 19. They were spawned and they've been, they've weathered over the summer and now they're just trying to get close and get them to release size and 
get them out and go in some good conditions and they'll start their uh, 300 mile journey out to the Ocean. So the fall, the fall comes in around uh, June, July, or, right? Or July, July, August, September, right? But they, they, don't, they don't come to Battle Creek until about middle September because of water temperature. Okay. So they'll, they'll stay out in Barge Hole there in the Sacramento River because right. it's colder. Uh, Battle Creek will probably be in the mid 60s at that point. It won't cool off to, uh, it won't cool off to under 60 until about late September, early October. Okay. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. So then they once that cools down, they, they actually will just pivot and start heading up. That's cool. So then the the late fall comes in in like the end of November, December. Um, and that's fine. Yes, there, we can. We'll start seeing some late fall, early November, but we don't spawn late fall until January. So, so we try okay. to have a we try to have a distinction between the two runs. And is, it, overlap. is that when they're naturally spawning in the river too as well? When did the late fall actually spawn? Late fall would be November, December, uh, January. Okay, okay. Even some in February. And then that winter run comes in. Winter run will start coming in February. We collect them at Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery, the other, the satellite hatchery. Yep, up by Shasta. We'll collecting yeah. them March, April, May's the big month into June and then there's also when we start spawning them too. And then they naturally start spawning in like kind of that June, July. And that's why the rivers close up in Redding just to allow that to happen yeah, to protect above, that. Yeah, above, what is that, the 44 above 44 bridge. bridge. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So the, these raceways are roughly, I would say like three semi tractor trailers long and a little bit wider than a semi tractor trailer. Um, I noticed there's two levels of of like netting over the over the raceways i think i know what it's for but why why do you guys have the both low both there there's like one big one big wire mesh over the top that's a roughly 15 feet up off the deck and then there's other smaller ones that look more like a carport that you know one of the portable carports that you'd park your car or your boat under um, why do you have those two levels of it that way you have to do a tight roll cast to really catch it down. <laughs> I was thinking really that was be, to it's really, going to be tough, but I've got to get like back. Predation and then cooling the, cooling the, the yeah, raceways? Yeah, the wire is for the diving birds. Yeah. And then the other ones are shade cloth. Yeah. Uh, if you look down at it right now, you'll see that maybe, and just imagine if you were out here in July, you probably have about a, you probably have about a maybe an 18 inch path all the way down along the wall where you'd have shade. So you would get all the salmon along that little stretch of the wall. Uh, they're all packed together where by having these carports, three of them over the raceway provides shade a little bit wider. It spreads them all out. Less likely to get disease, all that stuff if they're well, not packed in. Feeding. It's also for feeding. We're able to broadcast our feed and we're able to feed more of them instead of just pouring them in one spot and then you're getting the competitive fish. And I got it. Okay. So okay. Okay. Yeah. The whole raceway, not just a small little path. Cool. That makes sense. So where are we headed off to next? Uh, let's walk down. Fish flash. That's my favorite spot. To go. Have you ever seen any birds dive down and and basically turn themselves into French fries? off the top of this <laughs> this grill. No, I have not. <laughs> that would be kind of cool to see. I've seen some herons that have walked in before and then have a hard time trying to figure out. Oh, really? <laughs> Chad, get a good look at these uh, size and silhouette. Oh, I do. That's, I'm uh, looking at them. That's what you're going to want to tie the for, for the striper. <laughs> so 80,000 in each raceway and they're going to be released in wow. um, the first rain event coming in. Basically, yeah, first rain event, hopefully after November. Thanksgiving. And it's it's it all at one time, or I think you said this, it's kind of spread out a little bit. The late fall program, uh, eleven of those raceways will go out at one time, and then we kind of have some other ones that are part of a surrogate release, and so they'll kind of be spread out, separated by a couple days. Gotcha. If there's any parents listening, because I see uh, I see like there's kids everywhere today. Um, if there's any parents listening that want to bring their kid and get a tour, how does that how does that work? Because well, this is, it's a well, pretty cool place to bring well, kids. What we're seeing today are school tours. Okay. And so we have a we have a 
small dedicated volunteer program up here and it's mostly retired folks now. So they come out every Tuesday and Thursday and they provide school tours. And so we send flyers out to the schools. Uh, we focus kind of fourth grade. seven days a week and we have kind of self-guided tours we have uh, outreach channels along the path that we're walking today and at other stops where they can get additional information and they're basically information plaques all over the place yeah yeah we're big into education here trying to let the public know what we're doing and explain why we're doing it so what are we walking up to now uh, we're walking up to an outside pond i call it pond three and so there should be some Falchman salmon in there. Cool. Oh, I see him. I see one. Though, so. See some sharks. So cool, man. I always, I don't, I came here last year and I'm still <laughs> like, dude, there's just so many, There, it's crazy to see this. So we're standing by a rather large pond. This a bunch of three foot maybe, fish. Uh, 30 feet wide by maybe uh, another 150 feet. And there's a few thousand salmon. You can hear them splashing. Uh, probably about 15 to 18 pounds on average. And they're going around. We're, we're bringing in them into our spawning building as we need them today. So these guys are staged out here. And then every one of them will hit the Grim Reaper but be milked or or egged or whatever, yeah? Yeah, the, the large green structure there in the middle of the pond is a crowder, and so we kind of push that forward down where the salmon are jumping to our right, gentlemen. We can kind of open those strings, allow in. Whoa. We don't want to bring all these fish in there at one time, so we'll bring in, you know, maybe a couple hundred at a time and go through them. And There's some tanks. So we always that one's try to huge. some fish out here so the public can see them. Look at that big male so right there. So the fish work their way up the ladder into this pond? Yep, this is kind of the, this is the end of the line. This is as far as they go. The water here is kind of either upwelling from the bottom or flowing in from the side. So they're kind of just milling around. They're every, all the way up here, they've been swimming up river, up with the current. And they're here, the current is coming up from the bottom of the pond. Was there any change in this infrastructure that's changed, like that's just <laughs> that one's greatly just increased me. the production here? Um, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't say it's increased in production, but uh, 12 years ago, the ladder was rebuilt over a two year period. So our ladder that you'll see today is a vertical slot baffle. So each time they swim through this opening, they go up one vertical foot in elevation. That's how they go from the river into our pond, where we're all used to the old ladders, like a like a pool jumping ladder. Where they, they actually jump, have, to have to jump, jump from, from pool, pool to pool to pool. pool. Right. So, uh, we only have like a, a two jump area where people can visitors can really see the salmon jumping. Everything else helps have the whole rig glasses and look at. What we do have is we have a we have a viewing platform that extends out over Battle Creek, and we'll go down there, and it's an awesome sight. Thousands of salmon. I mean, you forget that you're just two hours north of Sacramento. Right. You know, you right. think you're, you're you're you should be somewhere up further in the northern climate. Cool. Let's go check it out. Okay. So we're on a little bit of a walk over to the other section. Brett, uh, a few years back there was a 84 or 86 or estimated 80 pound king salmon found in Battle Creek. You're laughing and <laughs> and smiling about it. What comment about that? Um, yeah, that's like I think the nickname Salmonzilla. Uh, I uh, <laughs> uh, I know one of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife biologists that was. I saw that photo, man, that is a huge It's a fish. freak of nature. Holy Have you guys seen anything like that since? Nothing of that size. Yeah. Okay, so, noise is really going to pick up. We're, we're standing at the Coleman Fish Ladder now. Uh, there will be a lot of white noise in the background, and so we're walking down towards the, we're, the ladder entrance. Yeah, we're super close to the creek. We are basically at the creek now. Yep, you can see Battle Creek right over there, and so there should be some salmon hanging out. Oh yeah. There's a few down there. The ladder is currently closed. We 
We opened it yesterday. We allowed fish in it. So now we got to work fish up today and spawn. And then, as I mentioned earlier, part of our management strategy is I don't keep the ladder open and take everything and I'm trying to remain, keep a few out there in the creek. So they're coming in from yep, coming this in bottom from your, one? Your bottom. And then this is just the inflow on this side? Yeah. So it's kind a, of like horseshoe. It's this, it's a big concrete facility. It's got like a horseshoe flow through, right? Basically. And then... Yeah, the old ladder that was a, that we just talked about about two minutes ago was like a pull ladder. That went directly from the creek to pond three where we up where we just were. This new ladder that was built over a decade ago brings in water from Battle Creek. There's a bar rack over there that prevents the fish from going up Battle Creek. Okay. It's just it's just additional attraction water. As they go up right now they can only go up the fish ladder. Okay. When we're not collecting fish in say April, May, June, July we can alter this to by lowering a bar rack on the hatchery portion and we can pass fish around us. And you'll do that in the, those, those months? Then? Well, we used to. Now that we started the winter program, this is the first year we started collecting the winters. But this ladder allows us the flexibility right. to pass fish above us. Yeah, yeah. We have a weir out here and a lot of the visitors will cheer for the salmon as they attempt to jump this weir that we'll go out and look at. <laughs> the kids cheer but the weir is meant <laughs> to keep all the salmon below the hatchery entrance and yeah. them right now to enter the hatchery when battle creek will get up yeah, that, eventually, the, eventually the fish can swim above the weir but right. typically that would be december or january the fall program is over and so the, the weir is meant to keep fall chinook below and have them come into the hatchery and okay, so we just walked over like this 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 uh, ditch where this water's coming out. Is this all coming out of the hatchery? These this is all that water, water from the raceways. So this okay. is uh, this oh, because you're circulating. We're we're passing it back. So, okay, got it. So the ladder takes water from Battle Creek, water from the spawning building, and water from the raceways. Okay. And it goes out the entrance, and that's what okay. the action okay. is for the salmon. So when talking about the ozone stuff that's specifically inside that building where we're gonna go at no, some point. No that's only for the raceways we don't ozonate any of the water in the building that we'll go. Okay through. got it holy smokes so we're at the weir now and there's just literally like the, I think the most technical way to put it there's just shit tons of salmon. Holy smoke. And you can see them jumping at the weir they're challenging it yeah. they're trying to get up above they're but sometimes right. they'll make it over that thing? No. No, Only, okay. Well, not at this low, let me say. Okay. Uh, it's 330 CFS today. At, that's fish tight up to about 1,000 CFS. Okay. And so... Uh, that's pretty cool to see them all, huh? You can just... I love to come down here and take a break or when I need a it's break. It's a neat them. job because you can, you can see, like, the fruits of your labor every year, you know? You can. You get to come out Very here cool. and, you know, you can see what all the work the staff and that you did two, three years ago. Yeah. And it never gets old. I mean. It's, I got farmer buddies and it's, it, it seems like it's similar, you know, the, the uh, job satisfaction you get. Except now it's I really find cool. myself, you're looking down and you're not just seeing the salmon, you're looking to see if it's a male or it's a female. And so you're, you're kind of trying to look at how many of the ratio there is and what are the conditions of them. They look pretty clean. They look good. How long yeah. will it take for him to get to be green to being ready to go? How long does it take? Some of them come in ready to go. Others it might take, you know, a week. Yeah. Oh, so it's still pretty short time amount of time. Do you um like we had I don't know you I don't know if you listened to uh, we had we did an episode with this guy, uh we it's dubbed the Aquaman, he's he spears uh striper. And he, uh, we were talking about the stomach contents of like what he finds in some of the bigger, you know, alpha apex fish out there. And he said he, he finds quite a few lamprey. Do you see, are you guys getting any returns where you have lamprey on any of the salmon there? There are lamprey that return in the summertime. Uh, the, the Red Bluff office is the one kind of monitoring okay. that. They, even though the fish ladder and the collection yeah. It's more of the biologists at the Red Bluff Fish and Wildlife Office doing that. Uh, I do know that we, we did have one adult 
just returned that got all the way up into our spawning building this summer that typically they came right here in the lower part of the ladder. Our, our fish ladder has little slots in the bottom corners of them is designed for lamprey passage. They can, there's little, small okay. little slit hole in the bottom of the concrete where the fish can get in, basically the okay. wall and the floor where it yeah, a lot of people don't know that they're they're actually native, and that's why you guys facilitate yeah. that passage, right? Uh, so you don't see a ton of, of fish coming in that have lamprey attached to them. No, you you might see. Uh, I haven't seen any this year, but over the years you have seen ones that have a really not parade. It's a very circle circle cut. About an attribute, but I guess it's circular. But it's circular. <laughs> Uh, incision, you know, that yeah. looks like a uh, precision It's about the right. size of a silver dollar yeah. and, yeah, and ra a little radius. Little smaller, but yeah. yeah, I've never seen a lamprey attached. Well, those guys from Red Bluff, they say it's hard to imagine because we're looking at a huge, I mean, you look at biomass, there's so many salmon in here, right? But they say that those lampreys, is, it's the largest biomass in our, in, our, in our river systems, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around that there's yeah, that many of them in here you know but they've done walks where they're moving down battle creek in the lower sections and they see all these little tiny lamprey babies oh the amaces is what they call them. oh is it what are they called amaces. okay uh yeah but when you take that into consideration, consideration yeah the biomass is incredible if you're listening still and you don't know much about lamprey uh i encourage you to do a little research on them they're pretty they're pretty interesting creatures that are quite disgusting. terrifying also. That's a good Halloween episode. It is, man. Their teeth are the stuff nightmares are made of. Did you, you saw Return of the Jedi, right? When Boba Vett fell oh, into the pit. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that's the, the the creature designer for that, that pit, that, that's that what, pit monster. That's exactly what those lamprey mounds look like. <laughs> that's what Lucas kept sending back until they got perfect was. Yeah, dude. This, damn it. This. This is what I want. It was attached to my mood when I was in college. Okay, so Very we're cool. Gonna, we're gonna walk over into the spawning building. It's gonna get rather loud there. It's a small area with uh, Yeah, no worries. A lot of noise, but that's where we're processing the salmon today. What did you do when you first uh, started working here, Brett? And um, talk about the transition maybe a little uh, bit. I was I came down, I was deputy project leader. So I was uh, uh, number two in charge here. Okay. And, uh, and I had that job for about eight years. And then uh, my supervisor, unfortunately, had to retire early due to some health conditions. And uh, I kind of took on the acting role. And then, um, it took about a year and then got the permanent job. And uh, now it's been almost three years. And you guys have uh, how many employees uh, we working have, here? We have 25. Uh, 22 are permanent. We do hire some seasonals between the uh, months of October to April to kind of help us with the additional workload of spawning and taking care of 12 million vultures. Do any of these guys live on site? Yeah, we have, we have, we have some on site housing. We have employees that live here. Are you trying to figure out if you can jump the fence tonight? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. When, there's, uh, when there's alarms or power outages or things fail, uh, we don't have much time. We have to respond pretty quickly. So we're going to walk in right here into the spawning building. This building's open. Everybody's got orange rubber jackets on. Yep. Uh, this is a milking facility, basically? Like This is the spawning room. Okay. So, the noise of uh, a being bonked on the head. Uh, oh, you guys club them? We do. They're, okay. they're in a uh, CO2 bath right there when they're brought in, so they can kind of be uh, knocked out. And then, what's this guy like? Okay, so there's there's a, there's basically like a cleaning station, it looks like, but then there's four pipes. And he's like, he seems to be like, routing them into different pipes so what's going on there what's going on is there's no more females on the table and so now these are either green females or excess males that we're returning 
two different ponds. And so those four tubes, we can route them into large ponds inside or okay. back out to the pond that we just started with at Pond oh, 3. All right. And so it gives us options how to hold salmon for additional days. And so now they'll bring fish up in this lift, they'll crowd it up. You can see that lowering down into the water. Yeah. Um, probably bring in about two dozen to 30 salmon. They'll come down a grate, they'll fall into a bath that has. Whoa, look at that. Holy smoke. You got, if you're, if you're, uh, you've got kids, you absolutely need to bring them here like ASAP and check this out. It's pretty, pretty cool. And Little so kid will freak they're, out. They're gonna fall into this bath now, and the bath has a. Uh, CO2 bubble in it, so the fish, the fish get kind of knocked out, so we can safely handle them. These are, you know, 15, 18 pound, up to about 30 pound they're, fish. They're spry. You know, you, <laughs> you, you try to, you try to handle these fish when they're uh, upset and swimming. You're gonna it's get pretty tough, so especially we, all day doing it, right? You're gonna get hurt. And we got to go for a couple hundred, so yeah, we knock, we kind of knock them out. We then go through determine if uh, we get the females out, determine if they're ripe, ready to spawn. From then, that's when you, you know, we heard when we walked in, you hear the moth, the hit to the head. Yeah. And then we slide them down line. We try to make it humane, as we talked about, we had school groups here earlier. And so one of the things we do is we don't rip spawn. We use an airline there. So you see that stand right there. We will hang the female, Pearl Perkle, we'll hang it on the hook. And then we'll take a needle that's hooked to an airline. We'll press the needle into the abdomen, then it's hooked to a foot pedal. You press down the foot pedal, that distributes air through the line, forces all the eggs out the vent. Uh, and that's how we do it, so there's no blood, there's no gore. We're trying to, you know, try to make it a little bit more visitor friendly. Now, do we leave some eggs in the, in the body? Yes, but when you're spawning three to 4,000 females, salmon, you can kind of leave 40 to 50 eggs in there. Yeah. We then add the milk from the nail, we add water, and the process continues, and so that's how we're it, it literally, like, you, you mix the ingredients right here then. Yeah, right at that stage right there. We have some, okay. uh, we have some students from a local charter school that are getting some extra, uh, what do you call it, community service hours in today, so they're, they're helping <laughs> us there. And then you, uh, it only takes about a minute for the milk to fertilize all the eggs. And then you pour off the water, wow. and send them inside to our incubation building. And then we kind of like large file folders basically thinking of them. So we got... So these guys, these guys are just pulled up in the car are picking up the fertilized eggs or are they dropping off containers? They're dropping off the empty buckets for the okay. next go around. Okay. So, uh, so it's kind of like when you go through TSA and you go out the other side and you take <laughs> your stuff out, the guy grabs it and puts it at the front again for the next group. Brett, where do all the you're, salmon... You're very creative. <laughs> yeah, I know. I try to like give people analogies to hopefully like confuse to them kind of even more. Oh, they're garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, where do all the salmon go after the, this process is done? Uh, they go any fish that are spawned, we offer to Native American tribes. So local Native Americans are coming to pick them up. That's going on uh, right outside today. They come out and have a trailer. Oh, just left. So they come to get fish. And then the remaining hundreds of fish each day then go into this refrigeration unit that's outside, and that's part of the California food bank system. So we're done spawning. It's a, it's a carcass. It's not filleted. It's not clean. So it gets put on ice. It gets put in that truck. The truck goes all the way up to Bellingham, Washington, almost by the oh, state of Florida. Wow. And up there, there's a processing plant. They gut them, fillet them repackage the meat, send it back to California, to Sacramento, and then it's distributed through the food weathering system. And so that's all the salmon that are killed during spawning. If a fish was to jump out or die of a natural cause, those fish go to a rendering plant for fertilizer. So all the fish leave here, there's no big bear pit or anything like that that goes on. Do any of them go back into Battle Creek to be part of the ecosystem or food chain so again? None of the there's no nutrients enhancement. It, that would be what I would consider when we leave fish out there. In yeah. the right, right, right. Very cool. Yeah. So. It's crazy. Just so much, it's like a, it's like this big pipe 
waterworks project also, you know, like all the piping and everything and the there's a lot of operations management stuff to get it to where it's at today. It's crazy. And so this goes on every Tuesday, Thursday. Um, you know, your listeners can either call the hatchery or check out our social media and kind of yeah. find out what we're doing. And we're, uh, we're a federal hatchery and we're open 365 days a year. They can come out and take a look. We're not always spawning, but typically in October, early November, every Tuesday, Thursday, call ahead. Ask yeah, this, this is definitely a time to get out and check it out though. It's really, really cool. All right, sweet, what's next? So now we're gonna walk back and we're gonna, we're gonna walk back into a, a large building uh, that is near the parking lot. And uh, when your listeners show up, they'll see this building, that's the hatchery building. When you first pull in. That's where we have uh, all the fertilized eggs so the egg fertilization takes down here in the spawning building and then we probably got a quarter mile we have a little vehicle that drives the eggs up and then we put them in i guess i describe it as like file folders and so the water flows down from the top of these file folders and it's up wells in each file and uh, we're allowed not we're allowed but we we use 15 of these files put about 10,000 eggs in each of those and we'll leave them alone how long uh we'll, we'll leave them in there for about a, about three to four weeks depending on water temperature okay so the warmer the water the faster the eggs develop and uh, we wait till what we call an eye state where you actually look at the egg and you can see the little two dark eyes in the egg yeah that's a time that we'll handle that's what we do what do you mean by enumerate them? Um, we separate the, water. the live eggs from the dead eggs. Okay. Dead eggs. You can get fungus on the dead eggs, and then the fungus can overtake a good egg, suffocate it, thus creating more dead egg material, and then you can... You can uh, compounding. Yeah, so it just gets, gets out of hand. You lose some eggs, so mm. by keeping them clean and enumerated... Do you guys have any Alvins right now? Uh, no. I want to see, I, I still haven't seen an Alvin in the flesh. There's a picture of one right there. Yeah, I mean live though. <laughs> you mentioned you guys, you know, from Canada to Washington to Oregon, California, you guys all come together every once in a while and at a summit, it sounded like. Um, Conference. You guys learn a lot uh, off of each other and implement Best different strategies. Yeah, I was talking about, um, the Northwest Fish Culture Conference. It's a it's a yearly conference, and it's kind of spread throughout the different state agencies, and federal agencies, and even the Canadian fishery group. And so that's every December, and you can go there. Yeah, there's a lot of networking. Mm -hmm. I used to work up in Washington, at several federal fish hatcheries, and I still have connections up there. Um, every hatchery is a little bit different. But there's a lot of clever folks in hatchery systems that come up with a like whoosh a better way. Have you heard about whoosh? I have. I have. I we have. just interviewed them the other day. What you program. Um, they they came out here. Uh, it was a for what I was looking for. It was a little spendy to kind of move some fish out. But uh, you know, we'll just have to see how that keeps working. Um, so we're right in the middle of the hatchery building now, and then over here. Whoa. You're see I'm trying to think of an off-the-wall analogy for what I'm seeing, and I can't. Nick, it looks like a bunch of servers, but they're trays. Oh yeah, good. Yeah, like it, it looks exactly like a server farm. So we and now be a only gentle. Yeah. There, we're looking at a tray that has eggs that's only a week old, and so we want to be gentle with them. They're still in a developing, but now are there female and males in there, or? Yeah, you... these are the eggs from last Thursday that were spawned. So. Okay. Whoa. There's about 10,000 in there. So those, you can see some of the that might be dead. Yeah, those dead. were just eggs that weren't okay. fertilized at this point. Right. And, and it looks kind of like a silk screen. If you had anything silk, silk screen printed, there's just like this substrate that all these eggs are in. And then they're mm -hmm. in a, a big flat dish that looks, I don't know, about, it's it's shaped kind of like a, a deep dish pie or a deep dish uh, quiche now. kind of a <laughs> tray, but way bigger. 
Yeah, and so in plastic, yeah. and then they're racked. So they're in there, and I'll put that. I'll gently slide this back in. Uh, you know, we want to keep the water flowing over and keeping that water off. How long are they in here for? Depending on water temperature, about three to four weeks, uh -huh. and then we would enumerate them and remove the dead eggs, put them back, and then they spend probably about another couple of weeks. They'll hatch, and then. They're really, really fragile at the Alvin stage. You don't really want to mess with them. They'll, they'll still stay in the racks? They'll still stay in here. They will then, what we develop, and uh, they button up. That's when they're actually forming the salmon, the yolk sac that I think fly fishermen are familiar with. Yeah. Eventually, it kind of gets absorbed in the stomach. The, the fish develops around it, uses all that yolk. Now it's developed its mouth and its esophagus and its digestive system. And about mid-December, on average, to through Valentine's Day, all these uh, salmon fry will be ready to go outside. And so, uh, if you're thinking that we're taking fish from October 1st to the middle of November, that's kind of why then from Christmas all the way to Valentine's Day, we're also then putting fish out. And so, those large raceways that we walk by that currently have fish, we have to release those salmon and steelhead and make room for the new fall. Yeah, so okay. And this is also another operational constraint in terms of when you can release or not release fish. So maybe you've got another spot that the adults are kind of looking for the right environment. But there's there's other factors that are pushing them out maybe a week earlier than you'd want, something like that. Two years ago, we had warmer, not excessive, but it was warm December water temperature, yeah. which sped up the fry development. I had no room outside. I had to release some of the steelhead in late fall yeah. that were on site. I released them in not ideal conditions. It was low, clear water, no storm event, but you had to make room for the fry. You can't yeah. jeopardize the fry being, they need to develop, they need to get yeah. out. And so that was... And I, I think this is a really important point to make, is like when you're doing the armchair quarterback and for fisheries management, it's there's factors like that that maybe you're not considering that you guys actually have to deal with constraints yes. that we don't know about like that i had no idea that that was an issue so that makes sense and so this is a we're on day four of spawning so as we walk down this large row of servers as we've described uh, we're walking about halfway down and that's where we're at and so we're about 10 percent of the way there we still have to fill up 90 percent of the place so uh, Right now, everyone's smiling. We're doing great work. But it's kind of like uh, deadliest catch, you know. Uh, you got to get back out there and keep going. And so we're going to be doing this about three days a week for the next three to four weeks. What do you uh, think? Go ahead. No, I would, what do you think? We don't sleep during this time. About <laughs> and the, these just they, these that don't have any water, just kind of they're you have extra. We're working crap. that way. Oh. So we're working that way. So oh. we'll just, Turn on water as we need, okay. and then we'll just keep going. And it looks okay. like you disinfect everything. You guys are keeping everything super clean on the as you go. Yep, as you can see some of these servers that are sticking out, what we do is we're disinfecting the outside of the egg at that moment. So we put a little iodine in it, and now the staff that's here has a timer. And when that timer goes off, they'll come over here and push all these ones in. And so they're kind of getting a little bit of an iodine bath for okay. 15 minutes. It seems like a dirty job, the hatchery business. Well, you know, in terms of, like, it's just slimy and there's fish slime. And it's very physical. Yeah, you have to, yeah. You have to uh, appreciate wet and cold, or at least be able yeah. to tolerate it, probably yeah. a better way to say. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you, you're going to be out here in the summertime at 110, and you're going to be in the 40s in the wintertime. Do you, you guys have a plumber on staff? There's so many pipes with water. It just seems like this would be a constant, like, keep the plates spinning and make sure nothing breaks. Oh, we have a we have a maintenance staff here. Yeah. We also have an electrician. We have water treatment operators that help with water. We have biologists. We have animal caretakers. We have admin staff. Wow. So it, it, you know, we're about I got to mention there's 22 of us here permanently, three seasonal. So it takes a large group to do it. We all have our yeah. expertise. All just passionate about the natural resource. Yeah. Really cool. All right, so that's pretty much end to end, right? Yeah, that's pretty okay. much from very quick start to finish. <laughs> uh, you know, we focused on the falls. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the other, we have four total programs. So 
I don't know if we gave the steelhead or late fall enough love, but we highlighted some of the, the bigger programs and the newer programs. So. What do you cool. see the future of this hatchery? Do you guys, do you guys have plans of ex expanding this program or and like having more raceways? Are you applying for grants to do that? Like, are, what's the future? What well, do you see we're with funded it? through the United States Bureau of Reclamation on the mitigation hatchery, so we're here because of Shasta. Right. So at this time, we're well funded from Shasta Dam. Uh, there's no plans to expand it. I think we're just trying, as I mentioned earlier, doing those different releases. You know, figure out if we can do this study with the, the Nagiri project, yeah. with the with the rice field, seeing yeah. about this March release, trying to come up with some different tools to address. You know, don't really want to get into climate change and all that, but we've been through drought. I, I just right. was here a couple years ago. Went yeah. through that. I know we're only a couple years out. It's going to happen again. So yeah. having a March release, having potentially a rice field to put fry in and try to kind of make sure. You know, I think we just have to try to release as many fish as we can upstream as far as we can to have them return here uh you know we've done trucking and you know we we, ha we had low returns and so at the time it was the best decision made yep yep yeah you know you there's a lot of effort there's a lot of money that goes into this and then to release them into low river and conditions you know isn't isn't suitable for folks was that hard for you because you mentioned these are your, these are my babies you know these are my babies. Is that it's, is that whole period just really stressful, stressful for it's you? It's stressful because you're coming yeah. at two in the morning, and then you send a truck off, and we lost a truck the first year I was here. And what do you mean? Uh, a truck, a pump rope. Okay. And okay. so uh, I was young. I was new to management, and I remember a local paper kind of did a political cartoon, and I still remember that cartoon. And it was a bunch of uh, clowns running around a distribution truck. And so I take that to heart, you know. Yeah. Nobody at a hatchery enjoys when fish die. You know, we're all here because we're passionate about natural resources yeah. and we're passionate about fish. And so fast forward and trying to turn it around, every year when we were trucking, it's always in the back of my mind. You're only one pump away from having a fish loss. And when they're in a truck, there's no exit. There's no there. redundancy. I mean, it's that yeah. truck is on the road. You're checking oxygen levels. You're at the mercy of keeping all the equipment going. And then you have this multiple, multiple days in a row. Staff's running on empty. It's a stressful event. You have national media out here covering it. It's stressful. And I can't wait until I get the call that all those fish have gone in for that day. And it's like I can finally exhale after yeah. six hours of holding my breath. So it, it's definitely a stressful time. I, I, uh, it's a lot easier when it's rainy and there's high flows and we can release them on site than trucking. Can I, sh yeah. can I shake your hand and oh. thank you for all you do and yeah, you. Thanks, we appreciate man. your efforts and help and allowing you. you know for us to have a fishery to to, to catch these fish and yeah. I mean without you it wouldn't it wouldn't be possible. You know, it, so. um, if you're listening and you're not in the air you know in, in basically Northern California and can't make it to this hatchery there's you know there's state hatcheries in California obviously that you could visit if you're in California or you know look at Google on and look in your, your local area and see uh, take the kiddos it's pretty cool super educational I learned a lot for sure so I appreciate the time man welcome yeah Thank thanks you. a lot Brett special thanks to our sponsors without them this show would not be possible and thanks for listening if you have ideas or any questions for the show send an email to Sean at barbless.co or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash the barbless podcast and tap on the visit group link. Also be sure to follow us on Instagram at barbless.co or find us on YouTube. Thanks for listening.